Hey, welcome to Fathering Our Future, the podcast for dads. I'm Anthony Vandegrift, and I'm not the perfect dad, but every day I am trying to be better. I'm so thrilled to have Dr. Eugene Wilson on the podcast today. He's an accomplished author. He's an expert on the topic of leadership, and he is going to help us with our leadership as fathers. And he's also going to give us some wisdom on how we can guide our children to become leaders themselves. The focus is not really on the doing as much as it is the becoming. And if we'll become, then all of the doing that we need to do is going to flow out of that person that we have become. And that's what God's really interested in. And he'll take us to other places that we've never experienced before if we'll focus on becoming. If you're a dad who wants to embrace your God-given mission, make sure you subscribe to Fathering Our Future wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also get more content on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And if you want even more than that, then head over to www.fatheringourfuture.com. Well, Eugene, thank you so much for being with me. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. It's an honor, man. I've been looking forward to this. I appreciate that. I know we're going to have a lot of fun today, and I know that this is going to be a great conversation. You are a bit of a guru on the topic of leadership. You've written several books about it. And before we jump to the topic, though, just to give everyone some context, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Tell us how long you've been married, how many kids you have, the good stuff. Sure. I have been there 31 years this past wow. uh, February. I have two children. I have a 26 year old son, and he actually is getting married here in about 20 something days at the time that we we're talking. Uh, I don't remember the exact number, but June the 2nd. Wow. And then my daughter is getting married September the 2nd. And so uh, we have, uh, we, we talk about empty nests, but we are actually uh, have been for the last year and a half experienced in scattered nest. And yeah. so we are everywhere. <laughs> Our, our lives. And um, anyway, we're having a lot of fun and uh, we're going into a new phase and stage of our lives. So I think the next big deal for my wife and I is uh, grandparents. So maybe yeah. here in three, four years, we'll be, I don't know what name we're going to be, grandpa, granddaddy, pops. I think they're talking about pops right now. And it's it's we, usually whatever the grandbaby calls you. There you go. <laughs> and, and I'll answer to whatever it is. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I, I know you're going to be empty nesters. I hope you're not going to be uh, uh, empty bank accounters because two weddings in the same year can uh, put a hurting on some people. So hopefully uh, God God pulls through and faithfully provides for you on that topic. But, hey, um, man, thank you. For <laughs> of yeah, absolutely. Uh, be sure to post your cash app uh, QR code for everyone to be able to contribute. <laughs> um, yeah. So, wow, your kids are older than mine. I can't believe you've been married for almost as many years as I am old, not to say that you're old or anything, but pretty impressive. I, I What I pull from that is uh, you have a lot more t-shirts than I do that say been there and done that. And I think that you're a great person to talk on this topic of our our leadership abilities as fathers and how we guide our children to be leaders. Uh, you get to speak to this topic, not only from your uh, education, but also from your experience and from your reflections. And one of the best ways that I think we can learn, even though a lot of people say it's good to learn from your experiences. It's also really nice when we can learn from the experiences of others. So I appreciate you volunteering yourself as tribute for the benefit of the rest of us dads today. But let's jump into the conversation right here. Since you talk about leadership a lot, you've written books on the topic. How would you define a leader? That's a great question. Um, You know, Everyone, to a certain extent, is is a leader. Uh, everyone is leading someone. And John Maxwell uh, became fairly famous within Christian circles uh, because he defined leadership as influence. And so when you consider that, it, it is very true that everyone is influencing someone. So from that aspect, everyone is leading someone. Now, um, the, just the subject of influence itself is massive. Um, I mean, there, there's, you could spend a lifetime just talking about just that one aspect. What is influence? Um, how do you obtain it? How do you lose it? How do you get it back? Uh, and the list goes on and on. But I, in my doctoral studies, I came across a, a definition of leadership that I personally, I had two of them that I personally fell in love with. And uh, there's no one central definition, first of all, for a leader. Um, there are like over 300 and some definitions. So 
one that I really liked was that leadership is influencing um, others towards a common goal. And uh, I think that's really great because you don't really have influence over someone unless that person, uh, to a large extent, is heading the direction that you're heading. Uh, they have to have some kind of commonality. And so the common goal is, is a big part of that. Uh, part of that definition is um, when I read it, and I've kind of put it in my own words, but when I read it years ago was that it was the part of the process in which you influence. And certainly there is a journey or a process to leadership. And then the other one from Richard and Henry Blackaby that I fell in love with, uh, it was defining spiritual leadership. And they said that spiritual influ um, leadership is influencing people away from self agenda towards God's agenda. And um, those two definitions have just really resonated with me because you talk about the subject of being a father. Um, you know, there, there is a common goal with our family. And so getting everyone in an alignment with that common goal, that common purpose is a big deal. Those core values. You know, what does that look like? And I could expound on a lot of that um, and how that has impacted my life. But then also is away from self agenda. And, you know, any young married couple will tell you that at some point in time, you have to finally realize that you're not uh, the center. It's not about you. It's not about the spouse. It's not about the spouse. It's, it's when you come together, that togetherness and that common goal. And uh, which means many times you have to walk away from self agenda. And you really, truly have to align with God's agenda. So in a nutshell, that's my thoughts and concepts of leadership. Now, I didn't get there overnight and I, and I didn't arrive uh, in just reading that in North House's, uh, Peter North House was the first definition and Henry and Richard uh, Black would be the second definition. Well, I just didn't read that and it just right. resonate with him. And, you know, it was years of of getting there and then years of counseling, uh, helping people work through their difficulties. And then my own difficulties, my wife and I are, there was a time our marriage wasn't that great. And today uh, she's my best friend. We have a tremendous marriage, but we had to fight for those things. We had to figure this thing out that, um, you know, there has to be a better purpose than just our personal agenda. And so it's been a journey. So man, it really is truly an honor to be able to take a few moments and just share because so many people have impacted my life. I would not be where I'm at today if there hadn't been uh, incredible people that have impacted my life. And so this is just a way to give back and hopefully make a difference in others that just as others have made a difference in my life. Yeah. Well, I'm positive that this will make a difference in the lives of many fathers. Once this airs, everyone listening to this, I know they're going to be able to extract something out of that. Just even how you define the leader. I think it's really, it's it's really important to have the clarity on on what it is to be a leader. Now, I know you said that there's various definitions, but I like the ones that you pulled and how, you know, we're going for this common goal, but we're leading people to something other than ourselves in, in most cases. And I think as fathers, that's exactly what we're doing. We are disciples who are raising other disciples. God has partnered with us in this journey of parenting, and he is entrusting us with these yes. beautiful little gifts. And that's what we're doing. We are leaders and we're leading them to this goal that, you know, we also share with them. We're, we're leading them to God, yes. very similar to what you talked about in the spiritual aspect of leadership. That's what we're doing. So, so the goal of leadership is, is, is getting them to this destination, regardless of what that, that that destination might be for whoever the influencer happens to be. But as far, as far as we're concerned as fathers, that destination ought to be God. So could you talk about maybe on the practical side of things, what, what would be some of the things that we do as leaders, as fathers, uh, to help get our kids to that right direction, to that proper destination? Oh, thank you. Um, very practical. Um, don't be afraid to say you're sorry. Don't be afraid to say I made a mistake. Um, be hungry to, to improve, be hungry to grow. So podcasts like this, uh, books, I think the list goes on and on, but, but also be very much in awareness of what is going on in your own life. Um, one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself is um, self-awareness. And yet, uh, many times that's that's lacking. We we don't realize 
And so I have found it to be true that God puts godly people around me that will help me see areas that I'm lacking. My wife was one of those. Um, God used her to point out things that I needed to do to be a better dad. Uh, the time that I needed to spend with my family, God would use her. At the same token, uh, God used me to help my wife. My wife had some anger issues um, because of some things that happened to her as a child. And our kids were little. My son was about four. My daughter was one. And I went to my wife and I said, you have to get help. And we had a lot of conversations and I, at that time in our life. And I remember her coming to me and telling me that um, God had revealed to her why she was battling anger. And she began telling me what had happened to her as a child. And then God took my wife on a healing journey. And so, you know, God used my wife to help me grow. God used me to help my wife grow. And, um, and, and in that, owning those mistakes, owning those areas of, you know, I can improve here. You know, I, I need to make a, a change in my life. I remember I pastored in East Tennessee. Now I'm an avid fly fisherman. So you can see behind me my, my, my trout. And uh, I love to fly fish. So I fell in love with fly fishing in East Tennessee, grew up fishing. And I, and, you know, I had a wonderful dad, had a wonderful home, my wife too. I mean, wonderful family, but um, I'm living in East Tennessee and I'm learning how to fly fish. And um, we, we're, we're going through it at the time. We, we became pastor of a very small church. We're living in the church. Uh, we live in this little classroom and uh, I'm trying to teach my son how to, you know, use a fly rod. And, uh, you know, my daughter, uh, my son was three years and four months old when my daughter was born. So this is before we move out of the church. So we moved out right when my daughter was born. So my son is three years old and I gave him, a, you know, a $200 fly rod. And then and I ran in to the church to get something. Well, the next thing I knew the door was being open. Here comes my son and uh, with my rod. You know, and he breaks the rod, the door, he opens the door and the rod breaks. Well, now I am extremely frustrated, you know, and, and I shouldn't have been. Well, he comes to me the same thing. He's in and out the door and he comes to me and he's got a Robin's egg in his, in his hand and he's fascinated with it. Well, I'm, I'm frustrated. One of the worst things I've ever done in my life as a father, I mean, it was just horrible. I was mad and I grabbed the egg and I'm thinking to myself, that mother will never do anything with that egg. Now it's wasted. And my son won't stay outside. He keeps coming out the door and I opened up the door and I took that egg and I just threw it as far as I could. Well, my son is three years old. You know, he just starts crying. Well, instantly I'm like, you know, you just won the worst dad of the year awards. You know, I mean, what's the hell with you? You know, I mean, you're frustrated at a three year old. I mean, are you serious? I mean, you don't have, you can't control your emotions any better than that. And, um, you know, not minding, you know, that he it broke my rod and it's this combination right. of everything. And, uh, of course, the egg lands in these bushes and this, and he's just starts crying. Well, about that time, a bird is spooked and comes flying out of the bush. Thank God for the bird, because I quickly turned it and I went like, see, there's a bird, there's a bird. And then my son, he gets all excited because he thinks that the egg turned into a bird, you know. And um, I remember going to my son and saying, Bob, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now I'm probably going to tear up. My daughter is getting married. She, um, she just moved out of her home. Um, she's living a um, different town from where our house is at. And uh, got a good job. And so uh, Saturday, we ended up going out to eat for Mother's Day. And I, and I acted in some ways. And my daughter and I, we kind of clashed. And we're close. We have a very close relationship. And so she wanted to talk to me about it. And so we had a little conversation. And um, here I am at 56 years old. And I'm telling my daughter, babe, I'm sorry. And so I didn't, I didn't blow up. There was nothing bad. It was just a miscommunication, hurt my daughter's feelings. And she was just wanting to have an adult conversation with me about it. And, um, and she was right. We both had a own little parts in that, but part of that is, you know, we're cutting the apron strings and I'm not the hero that, all the time, you know, now she's got a new man and you're just, you're just adjusting. It's just life, you know? Yep. 
And, uh, and then I'm just telling my daughter, babe, I'm, I'm sorry. And so, um, I, I don't think that you can ever get away from that. I think it's just, there, there is just, this is not a science. This is not a one, two, three. This is not, you're not going to be perfect. We're all human. But right. the biggest thing out of all that is to recognize that, hey, I need to grow. I need, I need to be better than this. And you need to have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. And a fixed mindset, it's been proven. Research proves fixed mindset. You know, you're probably going to make less money. You know, probably less educated. You're probably, I mean, just on and on with a fixed mindset. So a growth mindset is that, hey, I can be better. I can improve. And so our, my approach is always, hey, I can be a better dad. So at 56 years old, I still want to be a better dad. And uh, I, I think I'm a whole lot better than I was uh, when my son was three, 30, 23 years ago when I threw the egg. Uh, I think I'm a whole lot better. And, uh, and yet I'm not perfect. And so right. recognizing those moments. Is big. I could go on. Man, there's so many other practical things, um, you know, that you can do. But those are the big ones. Those are the principles um, that yeah. to live out. I, th I think those are huge things. The growth mindset always, always be striving for something more because there's so much more out there. I think one of the best things that ever happened to me was a conversation with uh, someone that we're both buddies with, Steve Schobert. I had a conversation with him about a theological topic. And by the time that conversation was over with, I realized there's a lot more out there for me to learn than I actually know. And I, I realized how ignorant and how dumb I was at that point in my life. But whenever that transition happened for me, and I realized there's always something else out there, why wouldn't I want to keep growing? Why wouldn't I want to keep striving to be better? And so that's that's a philosophy that I carry with me in everything that I do, especially fatherhood. I start every episode with, I'm not the perfect dad, but every day I am trying to be better. And yeah. as fathers, I mean, naturally, I think we are leaders. I don't, I don't see us being anything else other than that. Um, yeah. We're definitely not dictators. We de it's definitely not our way or the highway. We we aren't the ones who control everything. If God's not a dictator to us, we have no right to be a dictator to our kids. And we can't be the coach. We can't be the guy who just sits on the couch and say, says, you know, you go do this and you do it that way, but you never do anything yourself because our kids learn from watching us too. Yeah. So um, we're definitely leaders. We're making the first move. We're initiating and, we're you know, we, yes, absolutely. 100%. We are influencers to our children. We are influencers in the home. So we have to strive to be better, but, you talked about something that I think is really difficult for a lot of men to do in that and in, in, in unpacking saying sorry to your kids, because in order to say sorry to your kids, you have to confront yourself, which you might be able to elaborate more on this because you've got more experience than I do with other people. But in the, in the men that I have encountered in my life, this isn't an easy thing to do because we don't want to unpack everything. We either attach it to emotion. We, we say it's too emotional. It's too mushy. And men aren't supposed to be that way. Or we know a little bit about what's inside of us. And we just, we don't want to expose it. We don't want to have to open it up. We don't want to deal with it. We just want to shove it in the back closet and move forward the best that we can. But in order to say, I'm sorry, you have to open up and say, you know what, I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong about this, there's probably some other ideas that get me to where I am today that I probably need to do some homework on and unpack and deal with. Um, but having that self-awareness, I, th I think that is a, that's a big thing. Yeah. Do this for me. What do you think we can do as, as men to become more self-aware? What, what, are, what are some of the steps that we need to take in order to get there? Yeah. A, a very practical. And then I want to talk uh, from a philosophical um couple statements I want to make, but very sure. practical. Um, listen, listen to those that love you and care for you, even though you don't agree. So if your spouse is telling you something, listen, if it's um, my father will tell me <clears throat> and would ask me, Hey son, have you spent time with your family? Uh, I know you're busy right now. I know you got a lot going on. Have you taken time with your kids? My dad would ask me that often. Um, I have friends that will tell me right now. Um, I, do you have some time set aside for you? Do you, you need a sabbatical? You need, you need to take three days of a retreat. I mean, you need, and I mean, on and on, and you need to listen, listen, and especially if you keep hearing the same thing over and over again, and even more so when God has been dealing with you about something and someone comes along and they're confirming it, uh, listen, and then, and then put together an action plan. 
Don't just hear it, but decide what you're going to do with it. You know, the difference between the wise men and the foolish men in the parable was that uh, the wise man built his house on a rock, but he was the guy who heard the word and did it. The foolish man, right. it wasn't that he didn't hear it. He heard it, but he just didn't do anything about it. And so it's one thing to know, but you have to take ownership of your of your actions and actually do something about it. And so I often say this and, and you know, Schobert and, and uh, Bishop Hargrove and, and wonderful people in North Cities um, say the same thing. But your, 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 your behaviors, they stem from your values. And so if you want to know what a person really, truly values, just watch their behavior. And so we can yeah. say, oh, I value this, I value that, and have a value statement, it's just like uh, Enron did, and it, it's meaningless if we're not living it. <laughs> right. And so, right. you know, and we'll take everybody else down with us. You know, I mean, they took, was it uh, Arthur uh, uh, Anderson, uh, Arthur Anderson, which had been around like 100 years, you know, accounting firm, and they crashed because of their connections with Enron. And, and if we're not careful, we'll take everybody else down. We'll take our children down. We'll take our marriage down. We'll, we'll, we'll destroy our lives if we're not careful. So it's not our value statements. Value statements are worthless if you're not living it. And so you got to look at, okay, how am I living my life? And, and in living your life in those values, you got to understand where does those values come from? And um, there's a book called The Genesis of Values. Don't buy it. It's out of print. It costs you a thousand bucks. And it's the hardest book I've ever read in my life. But the, the essence of the genesis of values is that your values come from society. They come from uh, your family of origin. They come from your experiences. I mean, the list goes on and on. Those are where values stem from. And you can sum it all up in saying that your values stem from your philosophies. And so you get your philosophies from how you're raised. You get your philosophies from the things you experienced in life, good and bad. They shape your philosophies. And so the cool thing about this is that the word of God should trump every stinking philosophy we've ever had. Right. I said stinking because, you know, we have a lot of bad philosophies. You know, I'll never go through that again. I'll never let anybody get close to me again. I'll never experience that again. Big boys don't ever, ever cry. And we get all these crazy philosophies many times from our family of origin or we get our philosophies from our society around us. And in America, I mean, let's face it, we're the most individualistic nation in the world. And so we have our own philosophies that are very individualistic. And the list goes on and on. And yet the word of God should trump everything. So the word of God tells us to be kind. The word of God tells us to forgive. The word of God tells us to turn the other cheek. The word of God. And so you got to make up your mind. Am I going to live by my own philosophy or am I going to live by God's word? And so if I'm going to allow the word of God to trump every other philosophy I've ever had in my life, then I'm going to end up being a person who's going to be kind. Now, I know that there's not a whole lot of accolades for an individual who's kind in our world today. I get it. But the word of God tells us to be kind. I know there's not a lot of accolades for the meek and the lowly. I know that. Now, Jesus Christ, his leadership was, was um, uh, they spoke of it, talked about it. he was meek and he was lowly. But, you know, today we wouldn't think, oh, man, that's a great leader. And let sure. you know, he turn his world upside down. So you got to make up your mind. Do I want my destination to be that I want to be a great father? I want to impact my children in the right direction. I want them to be in love with God. I want them to understand that the kingdom of God matters more than anything else in this world. Then if I want to be that kind of father, then I need to align myself with the word of God. The word of God should trump everything else. And then you have these values that come in your life and, and it shapes your children. And, that, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not the perfect dad and my kids are not perfect kids. Uh, but my, my son is 26. He's full time in our church. He's our band director. He's finishing up. Uh, he's got a year and a half left to get his master's of divinity from UGST. My daughter-in-law will graduate next year. I say daughter-in-law here in a couple of weeks, we'll graduate next year with her, um, her uh, master's in theological studies incredible. He's teaching. My son is teaching as an adjunct at Texas Bible College. Uh, my daughter just graduated with her BA in, in, uh, in counseling. She's got a job uh, helping autistic children and uh, she's in test right now. She's going to go on and get her master's. My son's already got his doctorate picked out that uh, he's going to pursue. Uh, both my kids are incredible in ministry. I've taken my daughter with me to Asia. 
Um, Jalen knows how to walk in the Holy Ghost. I've watched God use her and speak prophetically in the in the people's lives in profound ways. My son, the same way. And and a big part of that, I'm not like it's not all me, but but my life has been a big part of helping to shape my children. And I'm passing on things that have been passed on to me and things that I'm learning. So on a very practical sense in helping my kids grow, um, my son just posted this a couple of days ago it, and it kind of shocked me because I didn't remember this. Um, I don't remember the moment. He can remember the actual moment, but I, uh, the Lord, uh, about 15 years ago dealt with me strongly to back my dreams up by writing them down and in my ear, my heart, my mind, I would know them, hold on to them and I would perform them. That was a direct word from God in a dream. And it was a God given dream. And, um, I have, held on to that, but I never fulfilled it. I didn't write it down. And so we're, we're talking some years that go by and about six years ago. So we're talking about nine, 10 years. I mean, not writing it down. And I finally, I wrote it all down and I begin to uh, live out um, that I actually wrote down um, almost seven years ago that I want to be a college president. And now I'm a college president. And it was amazing the amount of things I wrote down. So my son, said that five years ago at a dinner conversation at dinner with our family that I said, I want every one of you to take time and write down five, 10, 15, 25 year goals. This is what I did for longer for my kids because Lord willing, they'll live a lot longer than, than I, than I will. And uh, my son said, I've done that. And he said, in five years later, he said, I've accomplished our will getting ready to accomplish everything that I wrote down five years ago. Wow. And so I'm living that out. And my daughter is like, this is on Facebook. My son doesn't comment on much on it. My daughter either. And uh, Facebook is for us old guys. And uh, so they don't you know, Facebook much. But my daughter was like, well, we're, I, I wasn't part of that conversation. And my wife goes, yeah, I don't remember that conversation either. But I've heard your dad talk about it. And Kay goes like, well, this is where we were at. This is what we were doing. And so it clicked with him. And he's living that out. You know, so I'm assuming knowing my daughter, she's probably since the last couple of days, she's probably written out her five. 10, 15, 25 year goals now. Yep. Isn't that cool? Wow. I mean, that's just that's so, so cool. cool. Man. And, that's and that's so cool. something that I didn't read in a book. Um, it was something that God dealt with me about. And then I'm able to right. pass that on with my kids. So what you said about your children catching it, um, you know, they, they really do. And you live that kind of life, you know, we've lived that life, my wife and I, and now seeing my kids do that. So I'm in a service here uh, in a chapel at TBC this past semester. And we had a uh, Mark Catable that's done missionary work all over the world. And uh, at the very end, he said, I want those that you feel led to get involved in missions to come stand out the front. And here came my daughter and I've known this. And then he handed the microphone. He says, name where you want to go. And she named where she wanted to go. And uh, it's areas where it's very difficult to go. And I'm standing back here and I can, I can't, I can't help but just weep. And the, the reason is, is I've taken my daughter places where it's difficult to go. So I don't know what God's going to do with her life and my future son-in-law, but uh, I know they're in good hands as far as long as they're walking with the Lord. Right. I, um, I'm sorry. I just went on a rant. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm glad. I'm glad you did. I, I love what you had to say because I have said recently a few times that it's not up to us as dads, even as parents to define the path of our children. And I think this is a trap that a lot of dads in particular fall into, especially when it comes to things that maybe they came up short in in their upbringing, you know, they wanted to make it to the NBA and they just, they fell short, they blew their knee out. And so the moment they have a son, they put a basketball in his hands and they work with him day in and day out so that he can go pro and they kind of live vicariously through their children. It's not up to us to direct and to define the path of our children. The Bible says that it's not even in man to direct his own path. And so our responsibility, the way I see it, our responsibility as fathers is to guide our kids in the right direction. And that direction is God. 
and then God will be the one who defines the path. And so I, I loved how you, you've brought all that together in your testimony and your story of living out these qualities, living out these attributes, having this growth mindset, striving to just be better in life all around, and then kids kind of catching the vision and seeing the influence and seeing the example, and then taking hold of that for themselves. And you've pointed them in the good direction, and now God's finishing the journey and defining Amen. the path. And Amen. I'm, I'm really great, grateful that you shared that story the way that you did. Um, Can I interject so, something real quick? Yeah, go. Let, let me let me let me just interject this for anyone that's listening. If you've never done this, I would encourage you to do this too. Sit down with your with your spouse and write out your values. Um, just do a quick search on Google. Just look for a list of values and then look at the list of values. And uh, while you're doing that, talk about the values that you um, had in your family of origin, uh, values that you were raised with as years went by. And just have discussion about all that. And when you get done looking at that list, you get done looking at how you were raised, values that you um, you appreciated in someone else's life, someone that you admired, what kind of values do they have? And the time you get done talking about all that, spend about 45 minutes talking about that and then write down your list of values and let your wife write down her list of values and compare the two lists and then look and see what are the four to five, maybe six or seven values that you would want to live in your marriage, in your home. And um, it's amazing. I did not, no one ever told me to do that. Yeah. I did that two years ago and it, it was mind blowing. My wife and I compared our list and um, we are living those values in our children. We see our children um, have been living those values. And one of the big ones are that we value growing. That's a big one for my wife and I. My wife is finishing her doctorate. I went back to school as an adult learner. And now our kids are pursuing all this. They have their doctorates picked out. And uh, my daughter's not sure. So we'll see. She's definitely going to get her master's. Son's got his picked out. But all of that is because we live those values and it's influenced our kids' lives. We value experiences. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of value in retirement, have a whole lot of money and have a lot of wealth. Um, we, we don't have it and um, we don't value it. It's not a big deal to us, but we value experiences. So, and we've had some phenomenal experiences. We've traveled, we've done some phenomenal things. And so we place a lot of value on that and we have our list. And so um, anyway, I'm not saying that my list should be anybody else's, but just sit sure. down and look at that because it will help you find peace and realizing that your life is not the same as everyone else's and that's okay. Right. Absolutely. And that, that's a good practice to do just in general, just kind of playing off and germane to what you just said. I was recently on a, another podcast, Dear Young Married Couple, and we were talking about, you know, the role of the father, but they asked me at the end, you know, what's the one thing that I wish I would have either been told or wish I would have known as a, young married individual. And for me, it was having that, that close and that intimate and that intentional communication. That's never something that was given to me as a direction when I'm getting ready to get married. No one ever talks about that. You know, they might talk, you know, you need to talk to your wife, but they never really define what that looks like. But what you've just presented, that, that's really close to what that's supposed to look like. Having those really open, vulnerable conversations where I, I'm sure there were some things that you probably presented as a value that your wife was probably like, well, that's stupid. And then maybe it went the other way around. And sometimes that happens, but in being this, this togetherness, the way that you spoke of it earlier, this unity that we become, that's kind of what we have to do. We're denouncing individualism and we're becoming this unity in husband and wife. So let, let me, let me, let me talk about this or let me ask you this rather, because I think what we've alluded to is if we're going to, first of all, being a leader, what this actually is, being a leader is leading others to some sort of commonality. So for us in our context as Christian fathers, we are disciples ourselves who are raising other disciples. We are on our journey to God and we are bringing and directing our kids on that same journey with us to get them to God. So this is what we are doing. And one of the big ways that we do this is by working on ourselves, is trying to be better as 
men and as husbands and as fathers every day, as we grow, our children are absorbing everything from us. They're seeing our influence, they're seeing our example, and they're learning along the way. Is there anything else that you would advise fathers to do in the in the quest of leading their kids and also in the quest of trying to guide their kids to obtain these qualities of leadership? Is there anything outside of the example? Are there, just like you pointed out, having this specific conversation with your wife about values, are there specific conversations that we should have with our kids? Is is there anything on a practical level outside of just working on ourselves and letting our example influence our kids that we should do to help them in their leadership journey as well? Yes, thank you. Um, man, there's so many things I could say, but if I said those things, I would have to also say that I probably wasn't that good at all of sure. those. So I could talk about some very practical things in life, but uh, I've tried, um, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not perfect with it. So you know, getting my son to clean his room, um, I, I wasn't that great at that. Um, getting him to, uh, the list goes on. My daughter, uh, probably not, probably not the perfect guy um, with that. And we, we did okay. I mean, we wouldn't, but I wouldn't say that I would want to take a podcast and talk about all the great things that we did in those areas. But I will tell sure. you one thing that we were great at. And I think it's a crucial element, especially if you talk about leadership. And that is, is that we raised two kids and uh, young adults who are critical thinkers. And when I say critical thinker, I'm not talking about being critical about everything. Right. I'm just talking about being able to truly think and uh, process things. And both of our children are unbelievable critical thinkers. And uh, my son um, has fallen in love with the word of God, and he, but he's a critical thinker. And so he doesn't just read something and, uh, and just take it at face value. He's going to study it. He's going to dive deep into it. When he hears someone preaching and uh, he does this often, he'll text me and he'll say, dad, this is, this is out of context. This isn't right. This is, and usually it's at a youth event when he hears this, you know, <laughs> it's younger preaching. And my son is like, this is not accurate. And, and, and then I will get the same kind of text from my daughter. I mean, it'll light them up. And, um, and yeah, we, we teach them, you know, don't be mean, don't be ugly. Don't you know, right. we've all been there. We all make mistakes just because you understand something doesn't, you know, mean that you are, you know, some special person and the other person is an idiot. I mean, that's wrong. But at the same time, they don't they don't drink the Kool-Aid, um, neither one. And they will they will look at it and, and, and very, very much a critical thinker. And it's not just in hearing someone preach. It's in everything. My both of my children are extremely critical thinkers. They're both very sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Uh, they're very um, uh, aligned with Scripture. And that critical thinking and the desire to align uh, with Scripture like that, it will serve them well. If they stay that way and, and remain humble, God will take them to depths that um, I've, I can never go. I've never been. I mean, they, they, they're so much farther down the road in that than I was at their age and um, develop that. And so one of the ways to develop that is to allow your children to have conversations, talk about things. Yes. And, you know, we, we would go home and we and I would talk about, OK, let's sit and talk. And you know, we didn't like bash the preacher. We, we never did that. Never allowed that in our home. But we would go, OK, you heard this mess. OK. You have some questions. Let's talk about it. what did you see? And then we, re we would refer back. Okay. No, it's not right to, to be ugly. Um, you know, sometimes you preach from a limited view or you could be that you're only addressing one part of the subject. It's like a beach ball. You turn the beach ball, it turns from white to green and you turn a little bit more, it turns yellow, turn a little bit more, it turns blue. And so there are different perspectives, but yet it's one beach ball. And so, okay, you know, you can't preach the whole entire Bible at one point in time. You can't teach the whole Bible at one at, at one time. So you're hearing one perspective. Okay. Let's look at some more perspectives. We would do this in our own family devotions. Uh, okay. What do you think about this? What do you think about the scripture? And we would dive deep in that taught my children what it is to be exegetical correct before they ever knew what the word exegetical was, you know, okay, read the scripture. Okay. Now let's read the scripture before that. Okay. What is the scripture after that saying? And so we'd have conversations right, right down the road. Okay. The Bible says 
that if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men. What do you all think that means? And it starts talking, okay, well, now look at the next verse of scripture. Oh, yep. thus he spake concerning the cross. Right. And so as the kids got in their teenage years, these were our common conversations. And so we taught our children to be critical thinkers. Now, along with that came, you know, things, okay, mom, why did you say no? Why did you say this? And well, like, you can't turn around and go like, because I said so. Right. Because I'm the adult. And that, that, that's not going to raise up a critical thinker, you right. know? And so you got, okay, now why would you think I said that? Why would that matter? Why would, and so we're always teaching, even in, in, in situations of adversity. And adversity has been, gives, adversity doesn't make you a great person. Adversity doesn't, is not a great teacher. Adversity can be a tool to help you become a great person. It can be a tool to be a great teacher, but it's all in how you receive it. And so we went through some things when my kids were, when, our, when they were teenagers, man, it was tough. It was very, very tough. But my wife and I did our best to walk with integrity, uh, to walk with the right spirit. And those things influence our children to be a critical thinker. So, I mean, I could go on, I could talk about all kinds of things, you know, the, the need to teach finances, the need to teach this and that. I mean, I, right. I talk about all those things and they're all very important. But for me, at the top of the list is that we cultivated an environment of critical thinking. And um, I, I, no one ever told me this. No one has ever, to this day, said what I just said. Yeah. To me. And yet I feel at, at my stage of life, I feel like it's one of the greatest gifts that we've given our children. Now, again, there's the other side of it because my daughter, she'll question everything. And I don't mean like being bad, but she will question it. She'll come to me. Well, dad, you said this. What about that? And, and you have to, you have to take time. To have those conversations because sometimes those conversations could last for an hour or two hours sure. and you got to invest in those conversations but um anyway to me it's worth, one of the greatest gifts we've given our kids worth the investment oh my word yeah so much so and now i, I listen to my son and and it's amazing to hear that, that even the two of my children i know this is something that we didn't do well um I, my my daughter and my son did not like each other. My daughter just about ate and my son and my wife and I would pray like, dear Lord, you know, what do we have done wrong? I mean, our kids are never going to like each other. And, and so for years, man, they, they, my daughter would just clash uh, with my son and this went on for years. And then you'd see it kind of warming up a little bit and they started understanding differences in personalities. Mm -hmm. And I remember that they're teenagers. She's, I don't know, 14, he's turning 18. And I remember them having a conversation. I could heard it on the other side of the wall, you know, the door. And I hear her at this conversation. Well, now, okay, this is the reason why we're different. And I hear them laughing. And then they'd clash again, you know. And now, having said that, my daughter has just asked my son to be one of the ministers at her wedding. And he is carrying what she considers to be the most spiritual part of their wedding. Wow. And um, he's going to be doing the communion. And the reason that she wants him there doing that is because she says that no one has impacted me biblically like my brother has. Wow. She said, because as a kid, she says, I would go into his room and say, Kate, I don't understand the scripture. Can you help me understand it? And he would break it down. And so this was the time of transition in our lives. I was gone a lot, traveling a lot. It was just a major upheaval in our life from April, um, of 2013 until uh, December, I slept in my own bed 32 times. I was gone. And so my daughter is in this transition. My son's in transition. He's getting ready to go to college. He's, you know, uh, 17. She's uh, 13 and a half, 14 years old at this time. And uh, he's impacting her life. And even though they're button heads, right. here we are 10 years later. And my daughter wants her brother to uh, be the speaker. And, um, man, that as a parent, uh, you're seeing all this come full circle. And now I'm just like, I'm so, I'm so thankful. I, I'm, I'm right. blessed. And, you know, again, no one told me this. Um, it was just something that was dear to us. My wife and I are critical thinkers. And the way I always approach that is that it's okay to say this is wrong. It's okay to say what my dad did and how he raised this. This wasn't right. 
how I experienced this in life. This shouldn't have been this way. What happened over here, they, they shouldn't have done that. But when you get done saying that this is the way it shouldn't be, and this wasn't right, it's okay to do that. But when you get done doing that, then you got to turn around and say, but you know what, God, you, you are sovereign. And your sovereignty tells me that you, you're the one who sets up kings and takes kings down. You set up kingdoms, you take kingdoms down. And if you wanted to, you could have kept me from that. But instead, you allow me the opportunity to go through it. So why did you allow me to go through that? Well, there has to be something I can learn and glean from that, that I can be better. Because all things work together for good. Mm -hmm. So I call it what it is. But then I look back at the sovereignty and say, God, you got it. And so you got to bring something good out. And so what is that good thing? And so is it a change that I need to make? Is there a, a time that you're going to put me in a, in a position that I'll be able to do things different? Can I be a better dad? Can I be a better husband? You know, can I do this better? Can I treat people better? And, um, and I have found in my life that um, more times than not, that God places in that place and he wants us to be that, that type of person. And of course, the scriptural principle is that he comforts those who are afflicted so that they will comfort those who are afflicted. And so I, you know, my dad was a great dad, but I hope I'm a better dad. Sure. And uh, I think I've been a good dad, but I hope my son is a better dad than right. I am. Yeah. And I, I think that that's part of the mission of fatherhood. I know you said a couple of times you, you might not have done something right and you probably weren't the best at this. And you said you're not perfect. You're definitely not the only person who shares that. I know you know that we're all imperfect people and that means we're going to be imperfect husbands and we're going to be imperfect dads, but we're, we should be in that same boat where we are trying to be better dads every day. But I, yes. I have defined the mission of fatherhood as equip as equipping and discipling our children to be a part of God's mission in a greater capacity than ourselves. I think about John the Baptist who pointed to Jesus and he says, I'm not even worthy to enlarge that man's shoes. This, this is the one that you need to follow. And even Jesus Toward the end, he told his disciples that they would go and do even greater works than he did. There's always this, the, the leader, as they phase out, usually calls those that are following them to go to even greater levels. And you express that in, in what you've shared, how, you know, your kids, even at their age, are way further down the pipe than you were at that age. And I think... I think you've fulfilled the mission, whether whether or not it was perfect. You, you've you've done good based off what you've shared, and thank you. And I'm I'm glad that you've shared your experiences to the degree that you have. Let me ask you one more thing on this topic, and then I'll ask you kind of my legacy question as we close out. But as far as being the leader in your home with your children, and then working with your children to develop them into the leaders that they're going to ultimately become, are there any unique differences that you can point out that you think are worth talking about between your son and your daughter? Because I know the dynamics are different as a dad. I've got two little girls and I've got a son. And I know even at six with my son, I'm one way with him that I'm not necessarily with my girls. So is there any wisdom that you can give on that front? Is there anything or same approach regardless if it's a son or a daughter? No, that, that's, that's a good question. And then I'm going to turn it just a little bit. Okay. Um, I think there, there, there definitely are some, some differences there. And um, a big one is that my, my daughter needed a little bit more time of personal investment um, with her than, than my son. My son needed a little bit more time with me, you know, taking him fishing, uh, playing golf with him, uh, spending time with him. My, my, we, we didn't get to play as much golf as I wanted to when he was young, but he loved it. But even to today, I take my son golfing. When I get done, it'll, he'll say, thanks, Dad. I really I really got a lot out of that. And just spending that time with him doing something that he loves means a tremendous amount to my son. I, I don't ever remember my daughter ever saying, you know, hey, Dad, thanks for – it's just that's not it. But right. we can go uh, to Starbucks or Sonic and – we did this a lot. We went North cities. We would go out to Sonic and uh, it was our, our deal that we did it every week at our art Starbucks and we would get something and we would sit in the car and talk. I remember one night talking out in front of North cities. My wife had gone to a, a practice 
and we had gone to Starbucks or Sonic. And I remember pulling in the parking lot and my daughter looked at me and she said, you know, and she's about 14 at the time. She said, I think I got this figured out. She said, um, I found myself on a deserted island. And she said, and I'm scared. And she said, I'm alone. And she says, and I need to get moving because there's nothing here. She goes, and I see this land out in the distance. And I think, okay, I can swim. I can make it there. And she goes, and I swim and I make it there only to find out that it's another deserted island. And she said, I kind of think that's a little bit what life is like. And she's 14 years old. She said, I think that you get scared and you think of a nerve and you start moving for something new. I wanted to get there and realize I can't just stay here. I got to move on to something else. And uh, I'll never forget that word picture, you know, for my 14 year old girl. Well, I was reminded of that the other day, you know, she's getting married and moving out. They sign a lease on their apartment. They're going to live in for a year or two. Uh, My future son all finishes national guard uh, duties and, and yet, that, you know, I, that, that's not the same as my son. My son is, is the opposite. But here's the deal I would say that I think is so important is to recognize the differences in personalities of your children. And I personally am a huge proponent of DISC personality, the D-I-S-C. Okay. Um, the reason I am is because research shows that two years after it's been taught, it's the second most effective um Thing and being able to be remembered and utilized. It's used all over the world. First is um, social styles, which deals with uh, communication styles. But they basically, you know, whether you go back, way back and use the sanguine, phlegmatic, you know, cleric, melancholy, or you're using colors, or you're using in a, uh, the enneagram, which my daughter says, I'm a four wing five when I'm healthy, but when <laughs> I'm a seven. And, and I'm like, I don't even, I'm, I'm lost in all the numbers, you know, yeah. or the Myers Briggs. And, but disc yeah. is it's easy. But knowing that, I wish I, I'm certified in DISC. Um, it made a huge difference. I wish I had known that when I was younger um, because I was able to recognize, oh, this is why my wife and I are so different. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't connect at all when you look at it strictly from our dominant personality trait. You know, I'm an sure. I. My wife is a C. I mean, an I is big picture people. Uh, a C is task and details. I mean, we have nothing in common. And yet... We make a great couple, you know, we yeah. compliment one another. But recognizing those differences in my children, oh, my word. That, to me, was the biggest deal is because I know my son, his personality, and how I have to relate to my son. And I know my daughter's personality, and I know how I have to relate to my daughter. I highly, highly, highly encourage. In fact, I would exhort everyone to, to do that and start recognizing that in your children, even when they're younger. And when they get a little older, have them take the personality test. It's fun. They'll love it. And then just figure out, okay, now how do I need to relate? How do I need to connect? And that's a big, big deal, man. It's a great tool. Yeah, I think it's really important too, especially when it comes to dealing with our kids, relating with our kids. This is why I do not give out a three-step plan to be the perfect dad, because there is no such thing. I'm going to talk about principles and I'm going to talk about good practices that you can implement, but every dad has the homework of identifying where their kids are at, understanding who their kids are as individuals, and then saying, how do I make these practices and these principles applicable, applicable to my family? That, 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 that's what we all have to do as fathers. So I, that's that's a good idea. And I, re, I remember when I was younger, they had us take a personality test, maybe in ninth grade. I thought it was a blast. I thought it was so fun. That's I'm, I'm glad you said that. So I'm going to put that somewhere on my calendar for what, 2040 or something when my kids are old enough and have some fun with that. But uh, I, I'm so appreciative of what you've contributed to this conversation today on on, on fathers and our leadership and the influence that we have on our children and how our example is so powerful in producing leaders in our children as well. Um, so much, I, I, I have taken away so much from this and I know everyone else listening to this is going to take away a load as well. But let me ask you this and that you can re- tie this back into leadership if you want, or you can just, whatever you're passionate about, whatever you believe the right answer to this question is. What's the best piece of advice that you would want to give to dads? Well, first of all, before I say that, um, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. And I believe that 
um, your ministry and your burden and passion here uh, is uh, going to make a huge impact. And, uh, and it needs to make a huge impact. If dads will step up to the plate, um, we can, my word, we can, we can reshape so much of our, of our world and North America and our churches and homes. And this is the missing element in so many places. So, so thank you. Um, the, the big one, the big one, um, you know, I, I my mind, <clears throat> let me back up and say it like this. When I went to get my uh, doctorate. They said that, uh, in three and a half years, um, if you move through this program and don't take any time off complete your basic, your dissertation. Uh, for me, it was a final project. You complete all that in three and a half, four years, you're going to walk across the stage and we are going to call you doctor. Um, today, you don't know anything. This is my first week of residency. You know nothing. I know some of you have been to Harvard, you got this degree and that degree, but you know nothing when it comes to leadership. And then the dean of the Global School and Entrepreneurship at Regent University, he laughed. And he said, you know, a little bit. He said, what the point is, he says, I don't care to hear what you have to say. He said, um, he said, I've been at this for decades longer than you have. And he said, and I've been studying leadership and teaching leadership. And he says, you don't know anything that will impress me. He says, so you know nothing. Man, we're scared to death. Man, he's like Winston Churchill, like <laughs> hanging, this gruff guy. And then he says, and when you walk across that stage three and a half years and we call you doctor, he said, and he kind of smiles a little bit. You have to get to know his personality, you know, he smiles a little bit. He said, you'll still know nothing. And then he said, now you're wondering, why are, why are you going to spend $60,000 and 26, 28 hours a week for three and a half to four years beyond all your job, your family, all that? And why are you going to do this? If you know, if you're not going to know anything and he says, well, this is what's going to happen. He says, we're going to teach you how to study and how to research and how to dig deep. And he said, when you walk across the stage, he said, it's going to be like we have taken you to a massive arena. He says, and we've opened up the door and we've cracked it open a little bit. And now you're able to look on the other side and on the other side, he said, is this massive arena just filled with leadership stuff. And he said, you can go around this entire arena and you pull out one little book from a shelf. And that one little book could be on one subject and you could spend the rest of your life devoted to that one element. And he said, and make a huge impact in our world. Now, I'll never forget that analogy. And so um, 56 years old, 31 years of marriage, 26 year old son, 23 year old daughter. I know a little bit more than I knew back then, but to a large extent, I still know nothing. I am, um, I'm wanting to grow. I, I want to improve. And the way I can do that, the best way I know to do that is by aligning myself with the word of God. There is a, uh, I'll make this as short as I can. I promise I won't take long, but I read something here some months back. That said that only one third of church leaders finish well. And uh, this is research of thousands of church leaders. So I'm intrigued. I'm wondering, okay, why do they not finish well? What does finish well mean? And the first thing I found out, the finish well meant that they do not settle. They don't plateau or they don't regress. And I'm like, okay, I got that. So why do they not finish well? And I found out that they were in this research, they found there were six phases of the life of a leader. And they said that the reason they don't finish well is that two thirds never make it out of the fourth stage. And the fourth stage is what is called life maturity. It's that when you go through crisis and when you go through junk and hurts and pains and, and sorrows, and you really go through some things that um, you don't regress or you don't settle or you don't plateau. And instead, you allow those things to drive you. Now, this is so interesting to drive you away from what has made you successful because what's made you successful at this point in time is what you do it's your skill set it's your abilities but to drive you away from that and instead cause you to focus on becoming 
And so the shift is to go from doing to becoming. And so I would say to you, Anthony, in everything that you're doing in a great ministry and to everyone listening in, I mean, great thing to be a dad, but um, the focus is not really on the doing as much as it is the becoming. And if we'll become, then all of the doing that we need to do is going to flow out of that person that we have become. And that's what God's really interested in. And he'll take us to other places that we've never experienced before if we'll focus on the becoming. That's so powerful. I'm I'm so glad you said that. Um, having that mentality of of growing, still getting to the end of the course and not not knowing nothing, but having having these this new ability and then the idea of of becoming rather than just focusing on what necessarily to do. I I talk about this um, when I talk about being a dad. It's not just that you get this new position that you have to hold for at least 18 years and then you get to retire. When you, when you have children, you become a dad. You, it's a, it's a change in your identity. Being a father is who you are, not what you are. And yeah, so good, man, you're the man. You had so much, so much good to say, so much awesome content to share. And I am super appreciative for you taking time you shared your busy schedule with me before this. It would probably take you another hour to share it. If you tried to do it again, um, I'll let everyone take me at my word. You're a busy man. And so I'm, I'm grateful that you penciled me in to share this, your transparency and vulnerability and the willingness to share the story about throwing an egg when your son's only three years old. There's a lot of people who would just hold that tight and say, I'm not going to let people know I did that. Um, But I'm glad you did that because it it makes you, it makes you real. It makes you relatable and it makes you influential. It makes you a leader amongst us listening to this episode. So thank you for that. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you very much, man. Well, I can honestly say that was one of my favorite conversations that I have had on the podcast. Dr. Wilson had so much good to contribute to the topic, but you heard him for yourself, and I would highly recommend that you check out some of the books that he has written. I'm going to include some links in the description of this episode, but go ahead and do yourself a favor. Go to Amazon.com, search for Eugene Wilson. You'll find some of the books that he has authored, such as The Spiritually Healthy Leader, Rhythm, Getting Things Done When You Have Too Much to Do. Sounds like a book that I could really benefit from. Realign, God Called Leaders and Their Purpose. 70, Everyone Needs a Team, Leading Growth, on and on. You go check them out. Check out the links in the description. Go to Amazon.com. Now, I want to tell you what stood out to me in this conversation. This is what resonated with me. The fruit of a biblically-based approach to fatherhood. He kept going back to the Word of God, to the Bible, as the reason why he did the things that he did. And that is the only source that I pull from when I give anything on this podcast. The wisdom that I talk about, that I give, it is biblical wisdom. My understanding comes from the Bible. My faith, my belief, my approach to fatherhood is rooted in the Scriptures. I understand That as a father of three, ages six, four, and two, I cannot speak with authority and from experience to the dad who has teenagers. I know I can't. I know my limits. I know my scope. But the principles that I give are biblically based. And what I loved about the conversation with Eugene was as he shared what he did as a dad, how he allowed the Bible to be the foundation for his approach to fathering, We got to see the fruit of that. His children have grown up. They are heavily involved in ministry. They have a desire to continue to learn. They are critical thinkers still to this day. They have open communication. They have a bond with one another. There is love. There is grace. There is so much wrapped up. And it's all because a biblical approach to fatherhood. We got to see the fruit of that as he shared his stories. And that is what we want as dads. We want close relationships with our kids. We want them to grow and go further than we ever have or we ever will. That's what we want. And having a biblically based approach to fatherhood is going to make that possible. That's what's going to help us. That's going to be the right path for us if we truly want to be better dads 
every day. It is forever settled. It is unchanging. And the Word of God will never steer us in the wrong direction. So go to the Bible and let that be your source of inspiration. Let that be where you pull your wisdom, where you pull your inspiration and understanding to be a dad and to be a better dad every day. This is Fathering Our Future, the podcast for dads. I'm Anthony Vandegrift. Thank you so much for being with me, and I hope you will join me next time. Thank you again for listening to Fathering Our Future. If this episode has served you or you believe it will serve another dad in the future, make sure that you leave a like, a comment, a review, or share this so that it can reach another dad. And so that you don't miss out on another episode, make sure you subscribe to Fathering Our Future wherever you listen to podcasts. And again, for more great content, head over to www.fatheringourfuture.com.